the global agro-food system is nothing more, in fact, than the interconnection to international trade of local and regional agro-food systems, making possible their specialization, their opening, and their loss of autonomy, as well as a lot of uh, dysfunctioning at environmental and social uh, level. How did we get there? It's in fact the result of a long history driven by biogeochemical and geopolitical logic. In my talk, I, I just want first to highlight some of these biogeochemical logic behind the organization of regional agro-food systems as well as the geopolitical logic behind their interconnections. In the second part of my talk, I just would like to explore an alternative to the pursuit of this historical trajectory. I will do that, being a biogeochemist, uh, based on material flows analysis. In particular, the analysis of nitrogen flows, nitrogen fluxes. There are two reasons for this focus on nitrogen fluxes. The first is that nitrogen is the basis of food through protein. Nitrogen is, a, is an important, and proteins are the most important component of food, probably. And we can define a universal human minimum requirement of proteins, about a three and a half kilogram nitrogen per capita per year, just for tissue renewal, independently of the work uh, affected by, by the person. The second reason is that nitrogen is the main limiting factor of agricultural production, at least as at constant <laughs> water uh, availability. And so, so, so that, in fact, soil inputs to the soil, so, so soil inputs to, to crop, uh, determine crop yields uh, in most agricultural systems. For, for a given agricultural system, a given crop rotation, we can define a robust relationship between yield integrated over the crop rotation and total average nitrogen inputs, as illustrated here. And the third reason is that nitrogen is a very mobile element, uh, which make, him make it uh, very, uh, which produce very important losses uh, to the atmosphere and to the hydrosphere. Uh, the losses which are responsible for lots of environmental problems, including uh, overcrossing of planetary boundaries. So, let me look at this biogeochemical logic of the organization of regional agro-food systems. Any agricultural system <coughs> requires fertilization. Fertilization, in terms of nitrogen, is the uh, input of nitrogen to the soil just in replacement of the amount extracted by plants and exported through harvest. In, the, in shifting agriculture, a long forested fallow uh, is able to replenish the soil after harvest, uh, to replenish the nitrogen pool of the soil, uh, owing to uh, several years of forest regrowth and 
nitrogen fixation by legumes existing in this forest. In uh, flooded plains or delta of tri tropical rivers, the annual flood plays this role. In the traditional mixed crop and livestock system in Western Europe, it is in fact the association, the close connection of livestock and crop farming, which uh, ensure the fertilization. Livestock, of course, provide some meat and milk as food for, for humans, but its primary role is to convey nutrients from forest and grassland, sunny natural forest and grassland, to uh, croplands. Croplands which were divided into three parts, one of which was uh, kept fallow for one year out of three, uh, just for receiving animal manure and allowing the two other year uh, to get very satisfactory yields of cereals. This system was able to sustain uh, local rural population of about 40, 50 inhabitants per square kilometer and also to export to urban system outside the rural community uh, enough cereals and, uh, and animal products to sustain an average urban population of twen about 25 urban inhabitants per square kilometer. <coughs> this system was improved much in the 19th century when the fallow, the tree and fallow, was replaced by a culture, a crop of fodder legume, allowing to sustain more livestock, to provide more manure, to provide more, more nitrogen to the soil, and to increase uh, sig very significantly the uh, yield of cereals thus allowing to export much more surpluses to outside the rural community, making possible the demographic rise of cities and the development of industrial capitalism. England took the leadership of this process uh, and in agreement with the liberal dogma expressed by David Ricardo uh, specialized itself into industrial production. England became the, the workshop of the world. While delegating its food supply to its empire, the countries of its empire. So that in fact, at the end of the 19th century, up to 80% of England was depending on imports of cereals from outside uh, the country. In particular, in particular from the central Greek plain of America, of North America, where very rich soil, which were those of a perennial grassland uh, in place since uh, millenniums, was able to provide several yields about five to seven times higher than in Europe without any effort of fertilization. In fact, in fact this is the, the fourth <laughs> fertilization method, uh, mining just mining the nitrogen from the soil. Enormous surpluses were able to be exported out of this region by a very uh, small rural population of 
here on the earth. And this was, in fact, the beginning of, the, of what is called the first international food regime with England and the rest of Europe receiving lots of imports of ma massive imports of cereals from the rest of the world. Uh, the same was true to a lesser extent for oil crops and uh, animal products. Of course, this mining way of providing nitrogen to the crop was not sustainable. And at the end of the 19th century, uh, there was a yield collapse, uh, a very severe yield collapse for cereals in that region of the world. The soils became such so, so uh, degraded and uh, their organic matter content was so low that uh, this famous dust bowl occurred as described by John Steinbeck, for instance, in his novel, The Grapes of Wrath. The solution to this unsustainability problem uh, was met when Fritz Haber discovered the process for fixing atmospheric nitrogen into ammonia and uh, nitric acid uh, using very high temperature plus and high pressure, uh, there's very huge amount of fossil fuels, coal at that time, natural gas uh, currently. Owing to the generalization of this process and its use in agriculture, uh, a new type of agriculture happen with the replacement of the mining of the nitrogen from, from the soil by a commodified industrial product <laughs> <laughs> uh, which could be brought to the soil and still increase uh, the cereal yields providing still higher possibilities of cereal export. You've seen this, this picture, but behind the farmer there, it's no more livestock providing uh, manual and responsible for the fertility of the soil. It's industrial plants. And the peasant is sleeping. Sorry? And the peasant is sleeping. Yes. Agriculture became a secondary industrial process instead of a primary uh, activity. Okay. Uh, this, this new way of producing crops uh, had very important consequences. The first is that uh, it allows a complete disconnection between livestock production and crop production, with some region spe specializing into uh, cereal production based on uh, industrial fertilizer. Other region could specialize into livestock production based a little bit on local crop plant, but mostly on imported feed from uh, other regions. all with trade export capacity uh, much higher than any uh, of the previous agricultural system I showed you. The generalization of this system took, in, in Northern Europe at least, but everywhere in the world, about 30 years. Here, for the example of France, you can see how uh, the the agricultural systems which were, which were mostly mixed crop and livestock farming, uh, either grass or fodder based, became either crop, specialized crop uh, 
chlorophyll system for inducing absorption in cells, or specialized livestock breeding systems, as you have, for instance, in Britain. You, t you see that this took only 30, 40 years. Uh, due to a very uh, voluntarist will of the state, a very uh, state interventionist, which, uh, which very important uh, political will in it, uh, through, for instance, the money plan, also the Marshall Plan, because the United States were, were leading this process everywhere, and the uh, European Common Agriculture uh, Policy. This is, oh yes, to, to, to continue the, the example of France, you, you see uh, in yellow there uh, the, this region of reserved livestock with very low livestock densities, essentially uh, specialized into crop uh, farming, and in red the region specialized into livestock uh, farming. You <laughs> see the export of cereals from the crop the specialized cropping systems and the import of soybean from uh, South America uh, and this is an extremely open system which in two decades took uh, uh, appears and transformed completely the rural system of France. This was these 30 years were uh, under U.S. leadership, aided by national voluntary state policies. After the <coughs> collapse of the Eastern Bloc, these voluntarist policies of states declined and stopped and we are replaced by the leadership of globalized private companies under regulation uh, by the World Trade Organization, with the role of state being just to uh, maintain, to facilitate uh, the global trade and the uh, role of the international market. With also, as you can see here, uh, the role of new pioneer fronts based on deforestation becoming taking the place of the former great plain of North America as a source of uh, crop products for international trade and this is what is called the third food international food region in which we still are Okay, this is just for telling you this nice story <laughs> uh, in which we still are. And I, I like showing this, uh, these graphs which are piercing our world in data. You know this uh, website providing very uh, complete uh, data uh, in, uh, about everything. <laughs> at the global scale. Uh, I, I like, well, th this, uh, this graph shows the number of people in the world depending on Haber Bosch industrial fertilizer for the supply of their food. Uh, this graph shows that half the population of the world today depends on this kind of cropping systems. The comment by the authors of the of these graphs was Fritz Haber and Karl Bosch are estimated to have enabled the lives of several billion of people who otherwise would have died. I, I find that very strange because, of course, uh, those people would not have died without uh, Haber Bosch. Probably, what what you can say is that if the Haber Bosch process was not have, would not have been invented, agronomy would have developed in a quite other way. 
the hegemony of this kind of open uh, agricultural system would not have happened. But uh, certainly these people would not have died. So let me think about an alternative to agrochemical agriculture. Can we imagine a world without Haber-Bosch fertilizer? Can we try to build such a scenario? Let me first take the example of Europe, which during the third international food regime became a significant exporter of cereals, mostly to uh, North Africa, uh, of animal products, mostly to China, and an enormous importer of oil seeds and you know, oil seed fodder, cakes and soybean, in fact, uh, <coughs> mostly from South America. That's the situation of Europe today, uh, with a population of uh, 500 million inhabitants eating more than half animal proteins with a, a total uh, intake of uh, close to 6 kilogram nitrogen per capita and per year not exactly double but uh, much more than the basic requirement and okay the vegetal part of the food of these inhabitants are coming from, from Europe and cropland. But you see that the, pro the production of, uh, of cropland in Europe is for more than half used for feeding livestock. The rest is largely exported and about a little more than 10% is used for feeding the population, for meeting the requirement in vegetal proteins. The, the requirement in animal proteins are provided by the livestock. A little bit is exported. But the livestock is fed for more than one third by this imported soybean from South America. Now, regarding the fertilization of both the cropland and the permanent grassland in Europe, synthetic fertilizer plays the largest role. So the dependency of Europe is very large for synthetic fertilizer, uh, very high for imported feed, and you see that the export of cereals and animal products in terms of proteins is lower than the import of feed. So that you see that Europe is not feeding the world, but is depending on the rest of the world for its, uh, for, for supplying the food of its population. So that's the starting point of our scenario. How can we, oh yes, just one, one thing I have to, to show you, because this this overall picture doesn't see the internal specialization uh, between the different regions of Europe that you can see, for instance, here, uh, where, where you have this map of the different territorial specialization of agro-food systems uh, in the region of Europe with red region specialized, li like Brittany, but also the Netherlands, specialized into intensive livestock farming. And other regions, the yellow one, uh, specialize into uh, crop production, cereal production for export. So what can we do with that? How can we imagine an alternative to that? There are three levers three lever that we can uh, operate. The first one is, because we want to uh, do without synthetic fertilizer, the only way is to generalize 
long and diversified cropping system without synthetic fertilizer, but using a legume crop to provide the necessary nitrogen to the, the other plants of the rotation. This is just an inventory of organic cropping system currently in use <coughs> in Europe. In the north of Europe, you have this long rotation with lay. These are uh, artificial grasslands grazed by livestock. After three or four years of these artificial lays, uh, barley, cereals, or potatoes are grown on the same uh, space. And this rotation provides just a mix of animal and vegetal products. In the temperate zone of Europe here, you have this long and diversified crop rotation with so often alfalfa or, or clover at the end of the rotation, then three, two, two years of cereals, then uh, textile plants like flax, then again a legume, but a grain legume this time, and then again uh, two years of, of uh, cereals. Okay, that's the type of rotation that you find here in the temperate zone of Europe. In the south, you have shorter rotation using grain legumes as a provider of nitrogen. Okay, generalizing those uh, crop rotation, which are which do exist, which do, that are documented, that are well known in Europe, uh, is one basis of the scenario. The second, ba the second lever of the scenario is the reconnection of livestock farming and uh, crop farming. This implies we, can, we will do without long distance trade of feed. Livestock is fed on local resources. Those resources are grass and fodder legumes for ruminants, or they are possibly grain in excess of human needs, or uh, spill and uh, food wasted <laughs> for monogastrics like pork and poultry. The third lever uh, is a human diet. Human diet is today very rich in animal proteins, and that's also the um, <coughs> a legacy of these 30 years of modernization of agriculture. Uh, eating 65% of animal proteins is completely not uh, natural. It's completely different from what was the case in the time when uh, crop and livestock farming were the dominant agricultural system. In fact, it is also very uh, unhealthy. And the Eat Lancet Commission, the, Lan the Lancet is a medical journal, huh? the Eat Lancet Commission uh, provided what could be a more healthy and uh, sustainable food system. Translated into, in terms of nitrogen consumption per capita, it provides this kind of distribution between animal-based and, uh, and yes, plant-based uh, food. Okay, the generalization of these levels provides this picture of the agro of the functioning of Euro of the European system. Another another uh, distribution of uh, another diet for the population. Another system of production which much more grain legumes and a complete reconnection of livestock and crop farming. Uh, so, so that every region in Europe is now equilibrated in terms of crop and livestock production and connection. You see that this system does not import any synthetic fertilizer, does not import any 
feed for its writer and can still export substantial uh, amount of animal and vegetal products. In fact, this system produces much less because it uses much less resources for this production so that the waste, the losses and the waste of nitrogen are reduced by, uh, by, uh, by one third of that. Also, the total greenhouse gas emissions of these systems are reduced by a factor. Okay, we can do the same for the whole world. It's less detail, maybe, but there, there, there are many papers dealing with this question and defining the option space for feeding the world without deforestation. I forgot to say that in the scenario I didn't uh, change the, land, the current land use. So uh, it is not a scenario of extension of the agricultural uh, area. Uh, it respected completely the current distribution between cultivated and non-cultivated area. The same is, uh, is assumed for these scenarios uh, with the same distribution of agricultural land. Uh, starting from the reference 199, two scenarios were established. One, which is a conventional global orchestration uh, scenario with large disparities in the human diet. This is a scenario with an equitable diet based on four kilogram nitrogen per capita per year with 30% animal proteins in it. Uh, and this is a scenario with an equitable diet with only 20 percent animal proteins. Maximizing food sovereignty, this scenario is without any trade. This scenario still contains some international trade. Uh, but both of them show much lower total nitrogen losses, so much lower uh, overall pollution. So this is my conclusion. We can, in fact, we can dream of and maybe act for a false international food regime which would make without uh, nit industrial nitrogen fertilizer and much lower level of international trade. 